All right, I think we're going to get going here. I know it's 11.15 by my clock, and we have next 90 minutes of a lot of fun here. Uh, hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Arun Gupta. I am on the CNCF governing board, and I happen to be the chair as well. Um, and I'm very excited to be part of the CNCF governing board town hall. So we have several governing board members here. And um, we have only a few slides, but we um, expect this to be a more interactive session. And there are a few governing board members in the audience as well. So if you are on the governing board, please raise your hand and sitting in the audience. So we have a few governing board members. So Alan, Sudha are there. So feel free to engage in the conversation. By no means this is a panelist versus attendees here, okay? So yeah. Um, so maybe let's start with the introduction. Uh, first of all, um, my name is Arun, as I said, I work for Intel, I lead the open ecosystem team there. I've been on the governing board seven years, um, and this is my uh, second time elected governing board chair, and this is my third company um, on the governing board itself. And with that, I'll pass on to Christoph. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Christoph Blecker. Um, I work at Red Hat in my day job, but I actually sit on the governing board as one of the two elected maintainer representatives. Um, so I particularly represent the, community, the Kubernetes community, um, and then there's my other colleague, Craig Box, uh, who uh, represents the other graduated projects uh, on the governing board. Uh, my name is Jeremy. I uh, am at Datadog, and I lead the open source and technical community programs there. Uh, second year on the governing board is the one of the silver up. So if you're a silver member, feel free to grab it. Hey, my name's Steven Chen. I'm the VP of DevRel at JFrog. Um, I've been on the governing board for a while. <laughs> I haven't been counting. Um, and I think it's a it's a really great opportunity to to work with other folks. I represent the gold member um, companies, so we try to bring all that knowledge back to the gold member companies and represent issues for them. And um, I think as much as possible, we want to make the Kubernetes ecosystem really strong. So we're excited to hear and engage with all of you and get feedback. Uh, hello, my name is Alina Prohorchik. I'm a principal software engineer at Apple, and that's my second term on the governing board. I used to be there as a part of French here in the past. I'm Ian Bertuccio. I'm from Google's open source programs office and have been on the board as part of our membership in the CNCF. Hello, I'm Lachlan Evenson. I've been on the governing board for the CNCF since 2019. So if you can all remember back to those days, I think uh, San Diego was the conference I first joined the governing board. Uh, I work on Azure Cloud and uh, we have many projects in the CNCF, so it's great to be able to represent those projects and help build the ecosystem. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Emily Fox. I chair the technical oversight committee for CNCF, so I sit on the governing board in that capacity and I've been here just over a year, I think. Lose track of time. It's so much fun. Awesome. Uh, just to give a lay of the land, um, how many are silver members of CNCF? Any silver members here? A couple. Any gold members here? One. Uh, any end users here? No end users. Okay. Well, make it tough. Don't make it easy on us. I'm just going to give a structure of what CNCF governing board is about or how CNCF is structured. But ask us tough questions, you know, keep us challenged. Um, how does the CNCF governance look like? If you think about it, it's a three-legged stool, essentially. Um, there is governing board, which is responsible for the administrative financial aspect of the foundation itself, which is the CNCF foundation. Uh, then there is technical oversight committee, which is sort of which drives the technical agenda of the foundation. What projects get in, what projects stay, what is a sandbox incubation graduation criteria? How does that work? The overall technical direction of the foundation itself. <clears throat> and more recently, we created this end user technical advisory board. Because if we leave it up to the vendors, Intel by itself uh, being a vendor, we're going to take it in a very different direction. End users are the ones that keep us all grounded, that truly serve the needs of the customers and make it really relevant. And all of that, if you think about that three-legged stool, the seat on top of that is the support that is provided by the Linux Foundation staff, the CNCF staff. So there is, like you saw the keynote this morning by Priyanka Sharma, there are several members of the staff here that we work very intimately and closely with to make all of this work. 
you know, so think of this as a three-legged stool with a seat, and that's how we take this entire journey forward. I kind of touched into this a little bit, and you know, if you think about it in terms of governing board, what do we do? Uh, marketing, financial, and business oversight. You know, we, we meet regularly, there's a Slack channel, there's an email list, there are discussions that happen there quite regularly, um, any copyright, trademark, and IP policies that happen over there. So we have uh, different subcommittees where the work is being carved out. There's a marketing committee, there is a budget committee, there is a legal committee, which are subcommittees of the governing board itself where the discussions happen. And then they make a decision and then it comes back to the governing board that what is it that we need to do over there. So that's sort of the element that we look at it. License exceptions, you know, goes to the legal committee, they make a recommendation, it comes back to the governing board. And if there are concerns, there are issues, then we can raise it up, discuss this as a board, and do the right thing over there. <clears throat> uh, TOC, Technical Oversight Committee, is where you hear the most excitement happening, and I'm sure Emily can talk about that endlessly. But that's sort of where it provides a technical vision for CNCF. What new projects are gonna come in? Like, you know, these new working groups, these tags, the AIML um, working group that you heard about, which is part of the tag runtime, what's happening in that direction? You know, if there are, it's not just technology, it's a lot of people thing as well. So how do we pe make people work with each other? So there are a lot of those elements come around over there. Have that entire project life cycle from, by the time the project idea is proposed by pulling a request, like a, sending a PR, all the way to archival of the projects. What does that life cycle look like? You know, and what support do we need? You know, does the project really need funding from CNCF, in which case the recommendation could be made to the governing board and then take it from there? Again, the relationship is very tight. And as I talked about, the end user technical advisory board is sort of where the voice of the end user community um, and there are a couple of um, end users, you know, Alena being from one of the end users, Apple, uh, Boeing is also on the governing board. So there are a couple of end user member companies that are smack at the governing board itself. But this end user technical advisory board is sort of a space <clears throat> which is vendor free, but is only consisting of end users. And we took this initiative last year where we created a technical advisory board, which are again leaders which are again the companies that are prominent in the end user space and contributing and driving the direction uh, across that board. So they review and reprove, approve reference architectures. You know, hey, what should we do when we are deploying a cloud native deployment? Like what should a technology landscape look like? Um, they facilitate end user feedback to projects. Like if a project has a certain need and a requirement, how do you communicate back that into the project? And then improve visibility and adoption of CNCF projects. <clears throat> From a personal example I can talk about during my time at Apple, for example, we created a CNCF radar inside the company and we were providing guidance to different teams within Apple on what CNCF project, what stage of maturity they are and how do you adopt them. That was very helpful. <clears throat> so getting back to the role of the foundation, you know, the overall mission is to make cloud computing ubiquitous. That's sort of the fundamental. And in that sense, the governing board, the TOC, the end user technical advisory board, the CNCF staff, all of that work towards to drive global awareness and adoption. And cloud native is very common these days, but there are still a lot of customers, a lot of companies that are on the beginning of their journey, that are just still ramping up on their journey. So that's where we can provide that education. And then there are customers who are at a very far extreme end of, you know, at the pushing the envelope of cloud native. So how do we cater to that entire community, make sure it works for them? The stewardship of the community and the ecosystem. And it's a lot about technology, but it's a lot about people as well. So how do we handle that, all of that <clears throat> in entirety? One of the biggest advantages of any open source foundation is neutrality. You know, no one company kind of owns the copyright or the IP or the trademark. You know, when Kubernetes came to CNCF, it becomes CNCF copyright. It's not no longer a Google copyright. You know, and that really allowed everybody else to kind of contribute 
because now the fear is not there that that vendor is going to define and guide the roadmap. So that's the philosophy. You know, open ecosystem creates a equitable playground for everybody to compete, make the pie bigger, and have a piece. You know, I mean, if you think about all the managed Kubernetes services that are happening, that's sort of how it's working. The vendors are generating revenue out of it, they're funding it back into the community, and it kind of creates a positive feedback cycle. Events, trademark, branding, um, we can go on and on. I think that's the end of my slide. And with that, thank you for people who are coming in. Um, what I would maybe take a minute from each governing board member, and I'm putting them on the spot, they haven't been prepped for this. <laughs> Talk about what's on the top of your mind when you are in the governing board meeting. What are you thinking about that where we should take the foundation? Maybe take a minute and that gives people some context. And then I would open it up for any Q&A. And for people who want to ask a question, we got a mic in the middle of the aisle. So please walk over there. And for people who are like, this is all getting recorded. So let's make sure the questions are clearly heard. If not, then the panelists can repeat it. So, Take a minute on what's on the top of your mind when you are in the governing board meeting or strategy meeting or any of that. Christoph, oh, well, maybe let's start with Emily on the other side this time. Way to put me on the spot. Thanks, Arun. Uh, so when I'm in governing board meetings or when I'm preparing for them, my biggest concern is ensuring that technical community interests are appropriately represented to governing board members. Um, we have had a lot of feedback in the past, both from community members as well as governing board members, that they're not exactly clear what it is that the TOC is doing or why we're doing certain things. So what my job is to ensure that the governing board is well informed on where the TOC is headed, any potential uh, fires that might be headed their way, if we're aware of what they are, but also just keeping them informed on things that we're hearing about projects, potential issues that are coming up, ensuring projects have appropriate resources. Um, for example, a good ex um, we have a lack of contributors within the ecosystem today, both within projects as well as within technical advisory groups. So trying to identify strategies that the governing board can take to improve that situation for the entire ecosystem, those are the kinds of things that I think about. I think uh, it's going to be no surprise here, but I, over the, the period that the CNCF has been in existence, I think open source has only grown more and more important in the way the world operates. And I think we have a really unique opportunity to set um, things in motion. Open source itself is evolving uh, around the world. And I think we've built a great platform uh, with the team here that we have and the ecosystem of projects to build a really solid foundation to take that forward. So I think about you know, as we have the CNCF today, how do we continue to evolve open source in the ecosystem, in the marketplace, around the world? Because it's here to stay. It's an operational model that many people are utilizing open source. I think it's something like 90% of all companies are using open source in all their code. So we really have a duty to steward open source. And I think, you know, keynotes are all about AI. How are we going to take what we built here and what we've learnt from the last 10 years of Kubernetes and make that more durable because I think open source is going to play a very big role in the development of AI and the development of uh, humanity. So I see a moment here where, you know, I was in the room when the CNCF was announced. Craig was on stage in the Computer History Museum in, in Mountain View. And now I look back at that moment of being transitional to that kind of innovation that happened. What are we going to do now as AI is coming up and what is the next moment of innovation? And I think open source is going to be at the heart of that. So I look to this team, this community, this ecosystem of projects as what have we learned here? What can we take from here? And how do we continue to evolve? So I'm very interested in that kind of role and how we continue to evolve open source. So I think that's going to become increasingly important in the years to come. OK. Um, I guess you know, in my role as a governing board member, I think of really two things. Um, one, I think of, you know, you do not need a foundation to be open source. Open source is only the license. You can have a very, very successful open source project that is not in a foundation. A foundation has a very specific role to play. And I'm always thinking about, are we playing that role well? Are we providing the things the projects need to make it worth their time, to make it, to, you know, they want to be here, they want to come. 
um, there's, they're getting what they need out of being a foundation because that's a choice. You don't have to move your project to a foundation. So that's one thing I'm always thinking about. And the other thing I'm always thinking about are the contributors because if they walk away from those projects, if those projects are not well maintained and sustained, and that only happens because of contributors, then we have nothing. So I'm always thinking about, you know, are the programs we're offering, are the things we're designing, are the strategies we're taking serving contributors, and are they incentivizing projects to want to be here and to want to stay here? Uh, being a part of the end user company, end user interests is always a top priority for me, and um, how do we amplify their voices? And user tab establishment has been a great initiative. Uh, looking forward to engage more with them uh, as a part of the GB. And to echo to what Anne said is uh, existing project sustainability and health in the long run is very important. How do we maintain them? How do we keep the maintainers? How do we engage new maintainers is a very important thing to think about. Um, so I think when, when you look at what the governing board's role is and what we do, um, part of being a good governing board member and serving on the governing board is being an active listener to the issues, whether it's legal issues or it's project issues or different things which are coming up, and helping to contribute from our own experience or from our company experience um, to help make those things better for the projects and for the audience. And we all bring our own unique perspective in terms of stuff which we care about and we're interested in. And one of the things which I'm very passionate about, um, I know Arun is as well, is um, education, kind of educating the next generation of kids and cloud native technologists that they adopt Kubernetes, they adopt a lot of the graduated projects and incubating projects coming out of us. And one of the things we, we formed, actually it was a bunch of the governing board members who, who kicked this off, was CNCF Kids Day. And what CNCF Kids Day is that's a, um, a chance for us to engage, get local kids to come and learn. We're getting a wider variety of kids, a more diverse audience, um, folks who normally wouldn't be exposed to technology to be able to learn and practice in a setting. And um, if you're in the keynotes this morning, you saw one of the outputs of the CNCF Kids Day program, which was the FIPPI's AI Friends book. So that's released at KubeCon. We're actually using it for a workshop this Saturday. Um, so that's the CNCF Kids Day date. And um, I'm going to put them on the spot, but we actually have the the author and the illustrator in the audience. So if you wouldn't mind to stand up, Cassandra and Roman, give them a big round of applause. So the book actually exists. I'm holding it up. We're not just making up stuff which isn't written yet. <laughs> so this book teaches kids a little bit about AI ML technologies. If you all are familiar with the Scratch program, it's like block coding. So the, there's a workshop in the book where the kids can do Scratch on a familiar platform. And we have some AI ML integrations. So one of the pages has a scanning page. You hold it up to the camera and you can train your own image recognition model. All right, thank you. So like I think we all bring our own perspective. We all kind of bring unique things to the governing board and um, hopefully this is empowering the next generation of cloud native technologists. Yeah, that's great. Um, so th there's pros and cons to being near the end of the queue. It's you've had more time to think about it, but a lot of the things you thought were already said. So for me, whenever I'm participating on the governing board, I'm really trying to wear two different hats at the same time. One. Uh, you know, I am representing a vendor, so I, I do want to make sure, as was already pointed out, that you can have a successful open source project without the foundation. So we want to make sure that we truly are adding value and it's worth joining and renewing and continuing to spend your, your time, which is more important than anything, you know, with the CNCF. So that's always very top of mind on that side. But as an open source advocate, enthusiast, participant for basically my entire career, want to also make sure that the end users are well represented and we're providing value to that side of the community as well. So try to look at things through both lenses and then participate where I can. Um, I'll, I'll agree, it gets tough as you move down the line to kind of come up with something new, but uh, um, we're all here because we care and that we believe in the mission of the cloud native community to, to do what we're doing and to, to, to bring open source uh, um, to the world. Uh, when 
but part of that is ensuring that uh, the, the continued healthy operation of the foundation and sustainable operation of the foundation is oversight and feedback. And that's what I'm caring about in particular is making sure that, that the voice of the maintainers, the voice of the, the people who are working on these projects day to day is reflected in the governing board and in its decisions, as well as uh, giving insight into why the governing board is doing what it's doing back to the community and back to those maintainers. I'm thinking what to say, yeah. Well, uh, listening, a lot of listening actually on my side particularly. And um, I do talk to several governing board members quite regularly. I talk to the technical folks regularly, um, project leads quite regularly. Um, and I also try to push the foundation to go try out new things. Like Stephen was talking about the kids day. That was literally just a conversation. I don't know, uh, one of the Valencia, I believe, in a bus drive, we were going back from the governing board dinner. Kids day came out of that. Uh, this year, we are starting a brand new hackathon effort in partnership with the United Nations. And that hackathon is happening right now. Um, a lot of my time also gets focused working with the CNCF team, extremely cooperative in terms of not just doing things, but how do we streamline it better so that we could be more efficient. And once it's automated, get the heck out of the way and do more fun things. I think that's sort of my focus. So anywhere we are not doing things efficiently, challenge us. You know, challenge us, tell us, keep us honest on what can we do better, what can we do different to make it more impactful. And with that, actually we will open it up for any question on anything CNCF or in life or in general. Uh, please stand up to the mic and let's get the party going. Let's see who's going to be the first penguin. <laughs> All right. So I know, I know this is a common question, so I'm, I'm just going to ask it. I, I have my own answers. I think everybody in the room might have their own answers, but it, it's useful to hear it from the governing board. Elevator pitch. You're pitching the CNCF, the foundation, to a project. What does the CNCF do for a project? The gives and the gets, you mean? Yeah. Emily, you want to take a shot? I mean, we all have opinions. We can all share. So at a minimum, the CNCF provides a select set of services to open source projects within the foundation to include licensing review, um, some level of infrastructure support, some marketing and branding opportunities at the event, depending on their maturity level, and then there's a myriad of other services. Um, it really depends on the project, where it's at um, in their maturity, also the nature of the project itself. Not all projects that come into the foundation have a well-experienced set of software engineers running things behind the scenes, so they rely on CNCF staff to support them through managing an open source project in some cases. They also look to the technical advisory groups for some of that. Um, but generally, that's just the CNCF specific services that are provided. A lot of what I hear from projects that they get out of the CNCF is the sense of community and the hope that they can increase their contributor base, but that's not without effort on their part, and I think that's a lot of the messaging that's lost. It's a lot of give and take between both bodies, between the contributors and the community and CNCF, as well as with the projects themselves. Yeah, very much agree, and I think also as a project, especially if you're growing rapidly, the coding portion, the getting contributors, all super fun. The compliance, the legal, the governance, maybe you have a little ex less expertise there, or that's not what excites you, and that's a lot of what the CNCF can provide. So let me ask the question back. Do you think CNCF gives and gets are clearly documented and known, or do you think we can do a better job of that? Like if you were to go contribute a project, if you were to think about a foundation, do you think those gives and gets are clearly documented? I think they're maybe implicitly understood, but they're probably not officially documented. Okay. Probably. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's a good opportunity for us to take a look into it. Yeah. yeah. And Paige, so let's take an AR to document our gives and gets of CNCF clearly. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Arun. Hey. A few weeks ago, Linkerd made an announcement about the 
new releases being owned by the vendor community going forwards. And there's been some public discussion from the TOC and community members from this. What's the GB's thoughts? As a, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, as a TOC chair, let's see what's the opinion. So the TOC has actually already commented on the Linkerd issue, but I believe the question is for the broader governing board proper regarding whether or not the existing criteria and expectations of CNCF projects are sustainable moving forward in light that we have many open source projects that have a single vendor driving most of the contributions. So I think that is a good question for the governing board to consider given especially that the TOC is particularly already weighed in on Linkerd and we recently modified the moving levels criteria for incubation and graduation to help offset some of the conditions that could arise that cause changes like that to occur within projects. Um, the open source community is driven by volunteers. Um, and as such, we can't force anybody to necessarily do anything. But what we can do is ensure that expectations are clearly aligned. That when somebody comes to a CNCF project in a graduated status, what can they expect from that project? Um, and and what, what is the, the kind of consistent, uh, uh, the consistent expectation between projects? Um, sometimes there can be assumptions that, oh, because it is labeled as this, it should be this. Um, and that expectation can sometimes be misaligned throughout the community. Um, and in the, in the case of Linkerd, I, I think that it is something that the community, like the broad community, expects that there will be releases done because that's what that community did. That's what many other projects and communities do within the, 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 the CNCF. And I do think there can be a, a better, clear expectation both ways, both from the community and to the projects of, if you are at a CNCF a graduated level, an incubating level, sandbox level, what are, what is the community expecting of you and what are we expecting of the project to kind of figure out how it's going to do? And that's, this would be the same regardless of whether you have one single vendor that is doing the, the majority of the contributions to a project or whether you have a very diverse multi-vendor project. So I think, uh, go ahead. The on. assessment also should be ongoing, not just when moving levels, uh, the annual review process is as important for graduated projects as for sandbox and incubating. Yeah, I think maintainer diversity is super important. I mean, that's what gets the project thriving and that, that's what keeps the project relevant to a broad range of interests. So that's super critical. I think the question that I, would, I may ask is, are those expectations documented? Are those expectations clear? Are those transparent? Or is that happening behind the scene? If that is happening behind the scene, that is not correct. But if those are documented and those are made very clear that this is how the project is going to go and we are applying those ex expectations in a consistent manner across the project, that's what we strive for. And the point being, they being transparent, anybody can make a comment on that. No, it doesn't make sense. Why it doesn't make sense? Let's tell us about it. So having that dialogue is key. I was just going to comment just one thing. I think it's always this listening to the community and responding, right? So there's what's written and then there's the state of culture and expectation that's out there in the community and we always need to listen. And I think a lot of the chat has been about maybe that expectation wasn't written, but most people thought it was an expectation. So we have to respond to that and I don't suspect that this will be the last time happening but to piggyback on what Chris said, a lot of the justification I heard around the decision is the cost to do releases was quite high and as Christoph said, there's a, a bunch of volunteers volunteering time probably outside of their day jobs to make that happen and for that project they are entitled to make a decision that that maybe is not worth it for them, right? That we're not, as Christoph said, we don't dictate at that level what they must and must not do if they're volunteering their time. But I think we just need to listen to the community and understand what the expectations are and then write them into written law. It's, I think there's a lot of expectation that we've written everything down from the start, but it's an ebb and flow as we're all on this journey, journey together to write. It's kind of precedence and written and it's a mix of both and then we're going to have to iterate. So 
I suspect there'll be other things in the future that we'll have to make decisions about as we, we go. What I do like is there's, we should always operate with open and transparent decision making and discussion. Um, and I always, you know, more of a heads up is better because then we can talk through it and not respond reactively because, you know, those situations are always far more challenging than they need to be had, you know, had there been more opportunity to talk about it. So we, I think we need to continue those kind of uh, conversations and then we can make decisions. That's all. I, yeah. All right, Tim, go ahead. So far we've talked a fair amount about um, community and contribution, sustainability, and the word volunteers has been mentioned a number of times. I'd be curious to hear, especially from Stephen and also Jeremy as the gold member and silver member reps, we've had this tremendous growth. There we're about 30 gold members, almost 600 silver members now. And not to exclude the platinum member seats too, curious about your opinions too, but I'm curious if you could talk about if or to what extent you're able to go back to these member companies and try to drive more contribution and participation so it's less volunteer driven and we have more sustainability through the member corporations as well. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's a great question. Um, so uh, when you look at the CNCF and a lot of the contributing companies, there's, there's different things that companies bring and different value that they bring to the CNCF organization. And I think even within those organizations, um, there's different dynamics about how you get folks more involved in the CNCF. So, um, for example, in the keynotes today, they talked a bit about the AML working group and the work which is going on there. And there's a lot of different companies contributing. There's a lot of active contributions which are, which are technical in nature, which is not directly contributing to a project, but it contributes to the ecosystem. It helps to enable a pipeline of projects. It helps to, to build out the requirements for how we need to move forward in the AML space. So I think that some of those contributions are coming from a lot of the different companies which are involved. Um, for the engineering contributions, I think, I'll speak personally from a, um, a JFrog perspective. The discussion internally is always about, you know, when we're contributing like a full-time headcount or a, an FTE to a project, how does that contribute to things which also align with business priorities? And often you can make that case internally if it's going to help with efficiency of releases, if it's a critical open source project which your customers rely upon, so you need to have that um, engagement on the project. And I think that, you know, as representatives who, you know, represent our companies or represent the other member companies, we should be advocating more for stakeholders to make those arguments internally and get more folks involved. But it's, it's very difficult to, to mandate or make that a criteria for folks to, to sponsor and to support the CNCF because there's a wide variety of different types of contributions other than just supplying FTEs to open source projects. I don't know, Tim, if I have an answer exactly to, and, and I know you said platinum members should stand down, but I'll, I got some, I got some thoughts. Um, I, I, it's been interesting to me the last couple of KubeCons, you know, these cycles we've gone through, we are hitting in terms of attendees tens of, you know, 10, 11, 12,000 people. And then you go to the project contribution sessions to what you're alluding to and everybody's desperate for contributors. And so I think that just highlights this challenge we have of there are 12,000 people here and it seems we have missed educating and spreading the cultural expectation, to get back to expectations a little bit, about how the open source system works compared to, you know, you're buying licensed software off the shelf. Um, there is sort of this unwritten expectation about your user, you probably need to help with the contribution a little bit. We, we seem to have missed something there. Um, I think we've also maybe missed a little bit of really incentivizing the creation of net new things rather than putting those resources behind feature extension or other you know, core maintenance in existing things. So I think that's a, a question for the group to really think about and consider as a community. How do we sustain what we already have and how do we create the incentive structures to make that happen? One thought for me on that is um, when folks are contributing to, to projects, um, it's, it's a lot easier to justify internally to your company if you're like, okay, my work is attached to this feature and that feature enables something in my company. Very short kind of chain to justify it. 
it gets tougher when there's more links in that chain between the action that's being taken by somebody working for your company and the value that it's bringing. And going back to like even talking about like Linkerd or like a release process. A release process in itself is not like a feature, right? It's a, but it is a critical path thing if you want the artifact at the end. So companies understanding that when you're contributing, you're not just contributing because I want this feature, I want this thing in my project. Contributing is an investment into the project, an investment into the long-term sustainability. So even providing folks who can do some of that non-feature work to do things like serve on a release team, to go and do like bug triage, to go and do like the, 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 the unsung work in a community in order to enable these processes, even though there might be more links in the chain between that contribution and the actual value it's delivering to your company, um, it's still like a critical investment in the long-term sustainability of that project and to make sure that project still exists years from now in a healthy way um, for your, whatever your, your, your enterprise needs are. Yeah, one thing I'll just add, it wasn't immediately clear if you meant how are we advocating within our own single organization how we can contribute more or how we can get other organizations of similar size or broader. broader? Okay. Um, I was going to say, I think we could do a better job of sharing some of our internal knowledge of how we've been effective advocating internally because it can sometimes be difficult, um, but we could do a better job for the latter as well. So we have a contributor summit here which has been very useful for people who are deeply involved. It would be super helpful if you could have a report at the end of it with a project at least an area to contribute for both new and existing contributors, something that we can circulate within our companies and bring attention to. An opportunity that I see for us, like the way we are doing this town hall, we have started doing these town halls for the last couple of years, where we just reach out to the gold members and the silver members, and we tell them what's really happening at KubeCon within GB. So maybe an opportunity for us is there is a zero to merge program where we guide developers on how to become a contributor, send their first pull request, there's a structured program. Maybe we can engage that as part of the GB and the silver town hall decks and see if we can spread the word around that to Tim's point, at least raise the awareness, that's step one, and then see what the interest is after that. All right. Uh, I would have a comment to this one and the, I got the combo question, so sorry for the line behind me. Uh, the Contributor Summit, somebody mentioned it, it's still a little bit of exclusive and hidden event, so it's not listed, for example, in the main page of KubeCon. If you are going to KubeCon and you just Google KubeCon, you will not know that there is a Contributor Summit. So it's people just do not wander to the Contributor Summit. I think that is a little bit of an issue here. But to the uh, any comments to that? Yeah, so I, I don't know if you have a comment on that. Why is it exclusive event so far? So the, the Contributor Summit is designed to be a little bit of a closed door summit for contributors um, so that there is a safe space for those contributors to talk about some of these things internally. Um, the, the bar to attend the Contributor Summit is very low. Um, the, the, the main requirement, like for the Kubernetes Contributor Summit in particular, is you're a Kubernetes org member. Um, so it, it is a fairly low bar. We invite anybody who has contributed to Kubernetes or is interested in contributing to Kubernetes to go and look, because again, it is a very low bar, but it is designed to be a closed door event so that there are spaces for contributors to talk, basically have those honest conversations in person about what the project needs are, what can we do to uh, uh, strategize uh, around getting those needs met and, and the like. I wonder if there's an opportunity for us to do like a 101 track you know, at a future KubeCon where we bring these people on, where the project maintainers could come up. I don't know if there's something like that that exists. The project maintainers come up with their requests and we, do the matchmaking. We, we do a room. So uh, okay. uh, actually, I'll invite anybody who's interested in understanding where, where they might want to contribute, yeah. understanding even from a company perspective, if you have engineers working for you, if you have uh, uh, people who are interested in contributing working for you, we have a SIG meet and greet. Uh, uh, meet, the, meet the contributors, I think is what it's called this year, just to have a, a, a more clear kind of uh, uh, thing in the schedule. 
But we do have a session where there will be tables with all, diff all the different SIGs, all the different folks that are working on different areas of the Kubernetes project itself. For other projects that are non-Kubernetes, I believe there's contrib fast dates and stuff in the calendar all throughout the week. So if, if you have folks that are interested or you have uh, uh, people working for you um, that you want to get information on like where would their efforts be best used, definitely come and talk to us. It, it, it's on the schedule. We, we're, we're happy to talk to you about it. Okay, thanks. So um, the combo question. So every project secretly would like to be a CNCF project. So my question to you, like what is the, the secret of CNCF compared to other uh, foundations? So why projects are moving, for example, whatever from LFA and data to CNCF? What is that you do better than other foundations or what is your what is your secret? So that's the, that would be one question. The other question is like, isn't uh, the size of CNCF or the size of, of Linux Foundation is, uh, or is it healthy for the ecosystem in general? So isn't CNCF too big already? So I will say that as a reminder, the mission of the CNCF is to make cloud native ubiquitous, which means we're already going to be probably one of the largest foundations. Um, I believe the term letting a thousand flowers bloom has been commonly used, and that has been always one of the intents behind CNCF is to bring in as many projects that are um, utilizing cloud native design principles, practices, architectures, methodologies, all of those things. So we are always going to be designed to be big. And I would say we don't really have a secret if you're looking. Um, it's the community and it's the vibrancy associated with that. A lot of our projects come into the foundation because of the popularity, the awareness, the like the opportunities are abound here if you know how to capitalize on how the CNCF works. We've seen a lot of projects that are extremely successful. Kubernetes has a ton of special interest groups. They have a lot of attention. They have thousands of contributors. And some projects will never see that scale, but they're successful in their own right. And it's a lot in part because of the individual contributors that spend hours every day working on those projects, showing up to meetings, doing the work that nobody else wants to do. That's what's been making us successful is the heroes of the community that often go unsung, and those are the same individuals that we are starting to lose within the ecosystem. As Anne was saying uh, earlier, like you, because you don't need a foundation to have an open source project and to have a successful open source project, it's important to us to keep looking at that exact question of like, why should somebody, why should a company, why should individuals, why should they choose to come to our foundation and to have our foundation be the home for their, their, their open source project? What, are, what is the value you're getting out of that? Um, and to me, one of the, the most powerful things that I, I see there is that we create a, a, a safe, inclusive, open space for people to contribute so that people are enthusiastic about contributing. Like it, it is, it, when you come into a community and it's like, oh, actually I get to work with intelligent people from across the industry who are open, willing to share their knowledge, willing to share their expertise, like that is, it, it's empowering for, for folks. So creating that space has been really important, but it's always something that we need to keep revisiting to ensure that the foundation is meeting the needs of the projects in creating that space uh, um, for projects to be successful. And it, it is something that I, I would say that, you know, while, I, while we can always do better and we can always should be looking to improve, we've done, we've done at least a decently successful job because projects do look to the CNCF as far as um, that's where I want to be because that's the kind of community I want for my project. I, I would just say, you know, to summarize community, the secret source is community. I think the support for the projects, right, whatever they need, the support for the projects I think is a big thing, whether it's, you know, if you graduated, getting security audits done, there's a whole suite of services that we do to support projects. And then finally, I think it's, we are very mature in our organization and processes. They're documented, well-documented, they're discoverable. So onboard, you can onboard yourself. 
And I think that really speaks to the maturity of the organization. The TOC have done a fantastic job making it very discoverable and you can navigate the process on your own. And I think that speaks to a very uh, organized and mature um, foundation. So I think that's the, the last piece of the secret sauce of the CNCF. I would say having an agency over your intention is very important. So um, I became, in addition to being CNCF chair, I'm also the chair for the Open SSF uh, governing board. And these two are the largest foundations. And if we think about, there's a lot of overlap in terms of tax security work that is happening here versus what is happening in Open SSF. So one of the things that I work with the governing board is how can we have like not be in our silo that whatever is being worked upon in tax security, how could that work better with OpenSSF? You heard the message from Ibrahim this morning on LFAI and data. So if cloud native and AI has to work together, it cannot be just within CNCF. It's got to work with the LFAI and data. So yes, it has grown big because of all the reasons, but we are having that intention and desire to work with other foundations so that we lift the entire ecosystem up along with us. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Christian Klein. I'm from Elasticis, a CNCF Silver member, and I'm mostly passionate about the intersection of legal and tech. Anybody else out here, or am I just by myself? Okay, anyway, so I wanted to thank you very much for all the great work that you're doing, and especially that thing there with the licensing, trademarks, and license exceptions. I have actually read those documents, and I find them really great because as a product owner for a Kubernetes distribution, that kind of allows me to cut my bills of materials as, oh, I got in a CNCF project, I trust these people, they know how to deal with these things, I don't need to investigate further. On the other hand, I also noticed that, especially in Europe, the legal landscape has become messier. Um, it seems like in the age of AI, it's not only technologists and platform engineers, but also politicians who want to stay relevant. And I noticed, for example, this morning, a little bit of a, um, I found it a bit surprising that although AI was very, I mean, basically every slide was with AI this morning, but there was no discussion about the EU AI Act, which, like I said, I found a bit surprising. So I was wondering, where does the CNCF sees itself when it comes to legal and tech? Does it want to just deal with issues that you're already dealing with, or do you in the future want to bridge, let's say, what society at large needs with what technologies find fun to do? Um, let me just make a quick comment on this, and I'll let other folks chime in. But um, I think um, we actually spend a lot of time <laughs> on legal issues in the governing board. Um, Joanna, who, who was here earlier, um, actually was the one who briefed us on a lot of the um, copyright and, and trademark issues on AI code coming in to CNCF projects. I think that we're regularly briefed on legislation and laws, which are, are impacting the ability um, for projects um, f based on you know, open source licenses and other things related to AI. And so um, I would say that um, that is one of the roles of the governing board is to help the, the larger um, CNCF organization to make informed decisions that are gonna support the projects based on the ever-changing legal and technical landscape. I'll be quick with some information clarification about the CNCF and its legal position, but Arun, I was also noticing the time and we have quite a queue if you can help us stay. Oh, we have, we had 90 minutes, so don't worry. 90 minutes? We can minutes. go long, yeah, yeah. Oh. Well, we have 40 more minutes. Oh, I thought we had 10. Okay, yes. Um, 40 more minutes. <laughs> settle in. Let's it's get the long answer. version. It can take time. Settle in. Ah, no, 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 no. Um, so for information, so the, the Linux Foundation is, a, is registered in the United States and the United States has multiple tax codes for how it deals with nonprofit registrations. The type of nonprofit registration it has is one where you're only allowed about 15% of time spent, which is an ill-defined term, but also I'm not anybody's lawyer here. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm definitely not your lawyer. Um, so you have to be very careful as a, in this US registration about how much time you're spending dealing with essentially lobbying types of things. You're not allowed to do lobbying activities. So, you know, I think we have to, in any organization in that registration has to be careful where they pick and choose, you know, how am I gonna spend that time that I'm allotted? Um, 
I think for a lot of open source foundations at the, the last 18 months, their focus has been on the EU CRA instead of the EU AI Act. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. But the interesting part is the, um, and for folks who aren't aware, the EU CRA is the Cyber Resilience Act, and it's really focused on cybersecurity. But what became very interesting to the open source community were a couple lines in one particular article that talked about how do these conditions apply to open source projects and how do we define them and they came up with something called an open source steward. And as most people are picking apart this law and figuring out how is this going to apply to me, it seems to hint that foundations are going to be classified as open source stewards. So that's an interesting journey we'll get to go down. The interesting thing about the EU AI Act is that it, both those are pulling from the EU's same definition of product liability to define who is responsible for what in these situations. So I completely agree with you that we need to be paying equal attention to the AI Act because it's going to have a very similar take on what is the responsibility, who is responsible for an open source something mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to these conditions that we want to put and these regulations we want to put on AI. Mm -hmm. um, I will also say that the thing is it, doesn't, it wouldn't affect the CNCF alone, it would affect anybody involved in open source because it's broad sweeping. So I think there's other groups like the OSI just started up a new policy group to try and really bring together how are we a unified body rather than, you know, a hundred individual foundations giving feedback to regulators. Mm -hmm. I know some e-regulator feedback that was given at FOSDEM was this is really difficult for us as regulators to navigate. Can you all just show up in one unified front? And people say, no, nah, that's not how open source works. Mm -hmm. But you know, point taken that it was very difficult for them to figure out how do I get, you know, how do I talk to somebody in open source? And I apologize that Arun told me I had 90 minutes and I got on my soapbox. But does that kind of acknowledge your, your question in, enough? Yeah, in but just to make sure I understood the whole message correctly. Is it correct to say like, well, it's like the CNCF doesn't really have a choice. They will be kind of forced into having the discussion with politicians. Um, I think it's probably correct whether to say Whether they that, want to or not. That there's avenues that, you know, it's probably because we'll be, the projects will be impacted by how these regulations are defined. And there's avenues to figure out where do we appropriately give our feedback, where do we not. Um, I think for folks as member companies, there's also multiple other avenues, including your own ability to give feedback and other existing groups like the OSI to also channel those things through too. Maybe I'll add to this, you know, as Anne said, it's not just a CNCF problem. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the broader Linux foundation, there are a thousand plus projects, multiple foundations over there. And I know Jim Zemlin talks to all of these political bodies to kind of put the feedback back out there. Mike Dolan, who's the SVP and legal counsel, for um, LF, you know, they are in regular dialogues over there. It's just that the AI Act does not impact CNCF directly by itself, but as that engagement is going to be more. Oh yes, and more, it does a rune. Well, I mean, the discuss, that has not been discussed in the legal committee. Let's say that way for now. Mm -hmm. So eventually, yes, it'll come to it. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Hey, Paris. Miss you all. Um, as of today, outside of um, projects needing more contributors and maintainers, what are some of the biggest risks to CNCF as a whole and its ecosystem, and how can uh, the community help? I think one of the most obvious risks right now is security of open source. And I think that's a big one in that we can lead the industry in. And we have, you know, foundations that are setting the standards on how to secure these things. But the realization, you know, I think Christoph was saying, there's so much open source, even in proprietary code, that whether you want to put your head in the sand and not look at those dependencies, it's sooner or later going to come, uh, you know, back home to roost. So I think just... I think we have a really interesting position right now where if we uh, come up with ways to transparently secure, distribute open source software, I think we, have, we could lead the industry with that through open source. So I think that's a really big risk right now to open source software and how it's uh, delivered because I think we have, you know, we have a fantastic worldwide community and we can solve this problem together and I think solving it in the open together is the best way to do it in the security uh, way. So I just think we have a, a really big opportunity and burden on our shoulders to solve that and show that 
um, you know, we know how to solve this problem. So for me, it's secure, security and kind of the cybersecurity landscape as it's evolving right now. I think that's a, a, a big challenge that we need to face as a community. Um, I'll, I'll just <clears throat> add to Lockheed's point quickly, which um, I, I totally agree that security is a huge risk area, and I think there is um, a huge potential risk, which we're all stepping into, which is, um, you know, obviously there, there's all this momentum around AAML and AML workloads running on Kubernetes, and that has become a very large attack surface, which hackers, attackers, actually a lot of researchers are exploring for potential attacks as well. Um, and it, it opens up a whole bunch of different vectors to attack open source projects, open source models, do exploits, um, which are quite dangerous and quite, they, they don't follow the standard um, um, security model which we're used to for securing open source projects. So I will say something completely opposite. As a security person, <laughs> I'm gonna say security toil is one of the biggest risks in open source. There are a lot of best practices that have been defined for projects to adopt. There is a lot of tooling that has been made available for projects to take advantage of. But they all suffer from the same fundamental problem is that we are not doing security effectively or efficiently enough for open source. And what I mean to say is, the OpenSSF has the scorecards project. It is a highly opinionated perspective on how open source projects should be doing security without consideration that there are many different ways that a security control or requirement can be met by a given project that is not automatic or automatable in determining their compliance with that. And your risk is not the same as my risk, is not the same as somebody else's risk as an open source adopter. So we need to do a better job of making sure that the security requirements and expectations we are imposing on open source projects are actually realistic and achievable and move the needle in the right direction. So that, that's my caveat on that. But one of the other risks that I think exists within open source is accountability and open decisions. There has been an interesting shift in the past decade or so where there are some projects that have been moving more and more decisions behind closed doors. We're not seeing the results of the decisions and we're certainly not seeing the justification that went into why that decision was being made, just the fact that something occurred and the project has changed direction. We need to be more accountable in the decisions that are being made and the impact that they have on the community members as well as the adopters of those projects. And they need to be documented publicly in a manner that's discoverable and transparent. So anybody can follow up after the fact, reason about why the decision was made, and have a path to overturn it if necessary that those conditions and factors have been changed. Yeah. I'll, I'll put my security soapbox away, talk about the economy. Um, I think, to me, that, that's the kind of the thing on my mind right now, is it's very pragmatic, but just looking at the macroeconomic environment, you know, we think about, we hear stories of folks being like, you know, I didn't get to travel approval at my company to come to KubeCon, and you think about, okay, if you're in a two-year period where your manager says to you, you get one conference pass this year, and here's the responsibilities of your job. Are they gonna come to KubeCon? Are they gonna come to something else? Does that affect their contribution time? And you know, these things are all cycles. And so in a couple of years time, we'll probably be back in a place where the manager says, okay, you get four tickets this year, where are you going? So how do we keep that person engaged and involved and giving them what they need? So when things come back around, you know, they're still a part of this community, feel just connected. They don't feel like they've um, you know, been disconnected for three years and now they're coming back in. So I think that's just, um, for a lot of folks, this is probably a, the first time in their open source journey or time that we've been through a slightly macroeconomic decline. And so we're gonna learn how to get through that together. If I can kind of riff off both Lockie and Anne, I'd say that um, one of the, the biggest kind of risks as I see as, you know, as the economy shifts, as, as, as companies are taking a look at their investments in open source and figuring out what is the right level for us to invest in open source. Um, 
and as projects like, you know, again, coming from the Kubernetes the, the project itself, as some of the development and some of the feature development maybe slows from what it was a few years ago, and the, the technology kind of shifts in new areas like AI, um, I can see, I can already see it in the landscape where companies are like, oh, well, we're gonna invest less. Whether that's people, whether it's travel to conferences, whether it's just have be, having the project be visible and that the project is something they care about, they'll care about it a little bit less because their focus is over here. And as focus shifts onto, onto new things, a lot of the, the other projects that we built and things like Kubernetes are becoming more boring. They're becoming more stable. They're becoming more ubiquitous where it's like, we just assume that Kubernetes will always be there. We assume that some of these backbone projects that we build on top of will always be there. And ensuring that companies recognize that like, no, actually that still needs sustaining. That still needs money. It still needs time. It still needs investment. It still needs people. It needs all these things in order to continue for all these other th great things that you want to build to succeed, if you forget about it, then it becomes that like the, the XKCD comic where you have like open SSL is this tiny little thing in here and everybody just forgets about it because they assume that it's going to be there and it doesn't get the care and attention that it needs. Yeah, I think that was my, uh, in my head as well. I feel like I see a lot of money shifting from the boring going to the greenfield AI um, and that's kind of uh, my concern as well. Um. Yeah, I think one thing that runs in my head is, go back to the first KubeCon, yep. nobody would have ever guessed from 500 people will be 12,000 people here, right? Go out a decade, what that number gonna look like? Is it gonna be 50,000, 30,000? <clears> Do we have the processes set up in a way that we can scale? You know, the, um, CNCF has what, 160 odd projects right now? More, right? So, do we want to get to like 500 projects? Are we set up in that sense? Is the TOC staffed? No, those are my questions, like, you know, how do we scale? Like, are we set up to scale? Like, TOC is what, 11 members right now? Or nine? 11, yeah, so like, should, is that the right size? Should we have more? I know, should we get more people to Emily, you know, so that she can walk them around and approve more projects? Do we have enough funds in CNC? So I think those are the things that I think about, like five years out, three years out. If from 180 we go to 250, do we have enough funds? Like a couple of years ago, we had that crisis around Kubernetes infra. What if that crisis, something else is boiling up that happens again in two years? Are we ready? Are we able to see those signs ahead of time. So I think that's sort of where at least my head is. And those are the places if people can think about, you know, give us feedback that, okay, this is what needs to be fundamentally different or shift to make CNCF scale in three years, five years. That'd be great. So maybe we need um, TOC GPT? <clears throat> yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for the session. Um, so my question is basically around diversity. And yes, I can see a lot of things being done to improve diversity of... Can you get closer to the mic? My question is basically around diversity. Um, I can see a lot of things being done to improve diversity to cater for different needs. Um, Well, I'm not so sure how to ask the question, but I'm going to go on your hands, so permit me to talk about a lot of things and you can pick the question out of that. Um, I come from a region where, I, I came from, from Nigeria to attend um, CNCF, um, and basically to attend KubeCon, basically, um, and basically that was the reason for me coming here, and I, my colleague that we came together almost didn't make it, um, visa issues and whatnot, right? And coming here, I can see there is a lot of, there, there are different people, there are a lot of different people, different people from different places. But I guess maybe it's because it's KubeCon Europe, then it's very European-centric. So I'm talking about region now. 
not um, race or background or gender or what's not, right? Not diversity on those terms, but diversity on region, basically. And I think of myself and the region where I come from, and I see, okay, um, what is it that um, we can contribute, right? Um, the cloud native technologies are global. They're, um, they're global. They're not basically, um, they're not, I don't know what to say. Um, we consume a lot from, from, from cloud native. Um, we consume a lot from the, um, from most of the vendors that are here. Um, I think the last time I was at a conference, I mentioned that most of the vendors sponsoring were, most, most, most of the sponsors are vendors to my organization. Um, but um, apart, apart from the ones that were like local training, trainers and whatnot, right? So we consume a lot. But I see the fact that it's a lot more difficult for us to not just be consumers, for us to contribute back and to um, basically contribute back, right? And for example, I'm here on a I'm here on a corporate um, corporate attendee, right? Because I work in a corporate organization. <coughs> but the truth is that even though the organization is a corporate organization, the organization can't really um, the the corporate fee is actually high because of exchange rates and what's not, right? Um, so there are basically what I'm trying to say is. Um, there is a lot of effort in di um, to improve the diversity, but there are nuances in regional diversity that I think um, there should be a lot more that can be done. Um, I look at the members of the um, governing council, and I'm going to make a wild assumption. It's I would most likely be wrong, but I doubt if there is anyone on the council representing. I don't know whether Global South is the right generic term to use, but people that are um, like regions that are not, well, the, the region that I can say I come from, right? Um, and I honestly believe representation helps with diversity. The reason why I'm able to come and give this perspective is because I'm here. Without me being present, I wouldn't be able to represent this perspective. And I understand that um, we're all, we're, we're all, um, what's the right word to use here? Like our perspective and our experience shape our, our experiences and our, our lived experiences shape our perspective and the decisions we, we would make, right? Um, so if there are more people in more people present then you would have a more diverse um, array of opinions and be able to come up with um, a with, with decisions that help bring everyone together um, the last point I want to make is um, just looking at the technology ecosystem and the kind of talents we have and I was speaking with my I, I was at one of the co-located um, events yesterday and someone was, there were two people on stage giving, making a presentation about Ago City. And a lot of what they were doing were things that we, we have done or we've played around with. And I told them like, these things aren't new to us. Like we have a skill, we have a challenge, we have used these technologies to the point where um, some of these things that people on stage talk about are not um, new to us, but for some reason, um, we're not. We, um, con even the points we have not gotten to the point where we're even considering submitting a talk. Um, well, I've submitted a talk before, but 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 you get my point, right? Like um, there is because of um, the way things are, right? it's easier for us to feel, again, like consumers rather than contributors. And I believe there's a lot for us to contribute. Um, so back to the point of looking at the technical expertise that we have, the technical expertise I have on my team. 
there is a lot that I can get my team to contribute if, they, if it's easier to do that. Um, there is a lot I can convince my organization to contribute if it's easier for, for them to do that. Um, but because of the way things are then, it's, well, I think I've, I've said this again, it's, it's easier for us to be consumers rather than contributors. Uh, so, sorry, that's my two minute chance. Thank you. Um, we have a, an amazing technical advisory group called uh, Contributor Strategy. Uh, looks like many points that you've just brought up would be very much worth bringing to the discussion there. So we can have, or we can all collaborate and see what can be done to improve the experience uh, of people who are spread geographically. Uh, there are also several scholarships that CNCF provides for maintainers, and there's also a diversity scholarship. Uh, all the information is available on the website. And if you ever need to talk to any of us, we're also available. Uh, please feel free to Slack or email us if you need to follow up. So I'm going to go a little bit deeper than Alina did. Um, Tag Contributor Strategy is one of the technical advisory groups who is designed to facilitate contributions to cloud native projects as well as other technical advisory groups, working groups, other functions within CNCF. But they have limited resources available to them. They too need contributors to show up and point out problems within the ecosystem and not only point them out, but come up and provide ideas and recommendations for how to resolve them. Um, that is how the deaf of hard and hearing working group got started within Tag Contributor Strategy. It was one individual who recognized a gap in the ecosystem and they started identifying opportunities and met with individuals to pull together a group. And because of that, we've actually increased accessibility within KubeCon conferences. So that is one opportunity, but it does require individuals to show up. There are also KCD or Kubernetes Community Days. Those are regional events that any individual in the ecosystem can put on with assistance from a CNCF ambassador. And there are a lot of them here. They get a new cohort in the fall, I believe. So those are excellent opportunities to get specific regional or um, diversity-oriented activities and individuals interested in that space to get together and not only talk about the the technology, but talk about community building opportunities to expand the reach, because you're right. This foundation and our projects are only reflective of the individuals that are currently present. And quite frankly, we have significantly more adopters outside of the individuals that are represented either on stage or even in the audience here today. And we should be doing better in reaching out to them. But we can only do that when we know where they are and they are interested in being equal participants in that advancement. There are plenty of other groups, um, activities. There is ContribFest that goes on during KubeCon for getting more contributors into the project specifically. So if you're looking for technical contributions that way, that's one area. Um, showing up to public meetings. You don't necessarily need to be an active participant in any of the tags or even on the TOC to join any of our calls. You can listen in, you can comment on issues, you can join our discussions on our repo, any of those things. But we are actively seeking individuals that are willing to lead and champion a lot of these efforts because there's only a few of us that have the time and capacity to dedicate to do those and we need to expand that footprint beyond what's currently represented here on stage. Yeah, I just wanted to share an experience I was able to witness as part of the community and I think the, the growth of the developer community in India uh, so back in the day, there were very few Indian con contributors to Kubernetes and uh, the KCDs really facilitated the formation of community groups inside India. I was able to witness that um, from afar and see all these KCDs springing up into India. And that really united a, a bunch of community members in that place to the point where they have their own KubeCon now starting this year. So I would say, you know, through KCDs, you have a really great analog to connect with folks in your community and have it led by community members and representatives from those countries and build kind of that really tight-knit community. And that grows into something much bigger than what it started. But, um, and, and the outcome for Kubernetes is we've had many releases led by developers based out of India for many years now. So it's been great. I remember back when I started in Kubernetes, that was kind of a dream for those developers to have better representation from the Indi Indian um, 
develop a community. So I think, you know, you mentioned you're from Nigeria, right? You, you probably have that equal opportunity through those processes where people don't have to travel or ask their company for a lot of money, do that in the cities in Nigeria, and from that build these really large communities to the point where that may even be an option. Um, I'm sure you have a, you know, I've worked with a lot of folks in the community that are from Nigeria as well, not on the stage here today, but I know that you have a very vibrant developer community and a very technical uh, community in that area. Um, so really excited to have you um, join that. And I really hope through those processes that you feel like you can be part of the community because we'd love to have you all as part of this community. And we will be happy to connect you to any Cube Day organizers. Uh, there's a Cube Day Japan that happens for the very first time this year. And it's a great achievement for the community. The EGM. We got 15 more minutes. Any questions? Of course, Paris always has questions. <laughs> um, real or perceived? Uh, or I'm sorry, real or, um, or not, uh, there is a perception that um, when member companies uh, join and pay the CNCF, that they are um, also contributing because they feel like the, 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 the sale with the CNCF is that the CNCF helps with sustainability of projects. So when projects are going through a crisis period, I usually hear a lot of, well, what do we pay the CNCF for? And how can we, or how can we as a community and then you as the board help with a uh, alignment there for um, people to really understand? I guess, and this kind of goes back to sort of the, I think it was like one of the first questions that, were at, that was asked um, with how can we match really um, in a more concrete way what CNCF provides and doesn't provide. I think that's the, that's the key there. Like for instance, CNCF does not provide maintainers, right? You don't, and, and necessarily not even like fellowships or like something like the Russ Foundation does. Um, so yeah, just wanted to hear your ideas there. So I've heard that as well. And I know that there have been discussions around whether or not the CNCF should be employing individuals part-time or full-time to serve in some capacity on projects, either as a security team or as a maintainer. And it's a slippery slope because as soon as we start providing that, there is an expectation that it will always happen. If you give free sandwiches every day for lunch for a week, people are gonna come back the next week and ask where's the free sandwiches. And for us, we need to do a better job of setting expectations that when you are a member of the foundation, part of that membership fee covers the base costs of where things currently exist. But technology is a temporal product. That means what happens today is not gonna be the same thing for tomorrow, and it's going to be a different cost. And it's not just money, it's the cost of individuals' time in doing that contribution. So throwing dollars at the problem is not gonna solve it. We actually need engineers, individuals, that have the time, energy, and capacity to contribute their knowledge and expertise to these projects. That's another expectation that needs to be more forthright. I mean, you kind of hit it. I don't have much to say. But no, Paris, I think you, you, uh, you summed it up quite well that it's a misunderstanding about what those dollars are going towards. That's not, those dollars do not fund maintainers. Similar with, I put this project in the sandbox. There are no, there's no magical community that's going to show up to maintain it. And I think there's a misunderstanding on both those fronts of what happens. Um, so yeah, I think it is kind of a thing that the GB should be talking about more and thinking about more of how do we clear that up how do we you know, continue to iterate, reiterate that, um, yes, there are things that need dollars, money solves some problems, it doesn't put hands on keyboards, so if you're a user, this is how the system works. We also need the other part. Um, but I, th I think it's, like Emily was alluding to, you know, it's kind of been a discussion that's happened on and off for a couple of years about like, well, is this the model of this foundation, is it not? And I think, um, you know, today it is not, and so, that needs to just be made clear to folks because I think people have heard what's gone on in some of the discussions and we need to say this is the conclusion that we've come to about this model. 
I, I think the one thing that's become clear there is it's about expectations. I think each and every one of us is at one point today said better expectation setting is something that we should work on. So, yeah, the gives and the guests need to be very clearly that you know when you are giving the money at what level, what are what are you getting out of it? Yeah, point taken. Absolutely. And to Paris's point, what aren't you getting? I think yeah. it's just as important. Yeah. Yep. It is a pervasive problem throughout open source. There's actually a talk that I'm looking forward to later on this week uh, by uh, Dims and Tim Hawken uh, talking about people coming to repos and leaving comments on issues about, like, again, like they get a free sandwich, they get a free project, and they're like, but why aren't you implementing my feature? And I'm just going to come and I'm going to come on an issue and, and talk about, I want my feature now, why don't you just go do it? Like, people just come out of thin air to go and work on a thing. And it's like, if you, if you want something from an open source project, whether you're an individual user, whether you're a vendor, whether you're a member company, you need to invest into it, not just in the short term, but continuously. And having that expectation of like, oh, I can just write a check to the CNCF and that will cover everything that I ever need to contribute to this project and all I need to care about is in that one check once a year, doesn't quite cut it. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. On the same theme, and I, I don't disagree with anything you've said, uh, but just to echo, and maybe as a FYI, during the Contributor Summit yesterday, and, and maybe also important to call out the Kubernetes Contributor Summit, I think in the future, near term, it's gonna become a maintainer summit, which is a beneficial change to broaden the scope. But Kubernetes community yesterday repeated asks, why don't we have fellows? How could we get something? How could we get some? Very similar discussion there, but it's a, it's a misunderstanding. I think folks are looking to the LF and seeing a model there and wishing they had more of that. And then I don't know where it's gone, but OpenSSF was talking about hiring hundreds of developers possibly. Um, there's challenges to doing that, I think. But expectations, people are seeing other things out there and wanting some of it somehow. But also everything you said about how it's a challenge to make it work is completely true. Yeah, so um, let me comment a little bit on the fellow topic because actually I'm a former Rust board member. <laughs> so I, I also got to see things and the, the challenges from the, the other side of the pond. So um, I think that the, one of the big challenges when you um, have models like that where you're, you're putting dollars towards getting you know, either key folks or like you know, giving grants to folks who are contributing to projects is that um, it, it does become then an expectation, as folks have talked about, that, that the free sandwiches continue. But the, the other challenge it introduces is the companies who are contributing to the foundation, their mind shift switches from we invest in the projects and we put engineers on it because it's valuable to us to, well, we're paying the foundation for this. Why, why isn't this being funded or why aren't the funds being distributed to the maintainers? And um, I, I think that to, to kind of build that vision of um, letting a thousand flowers bloom in the CNCF, the, the, the way it's structured to um, you know, support projects and support maintainers but not to directly finance maintainers is, is an essential part of it. But we do need to find ways that we can continue to grow a robust ecosystem of maintainers and continue that forward. When there's been a Q Did I prompt something? Yeah, actually, so Stephen's description there reminded me of something else that happened at Contributor Summit. Um, there was a lot of question, and this is a, a recurring theme, but I think it's growing in the current macroeconomics. Everybody's saying, okay, so if we're not gonna get that for our money, how do I better advocate internally at my company? And somebody mentioned an idea of perhaps we could try to build something for a forum where folks like you, folks like me and others here, that we share our knowledge on how we do that. We, we teach these people who are maybe becoming senior developers how to talk to their CTO, somebody that they never actually get to talk to or are not comfortable talking to, but maybe we, we start sharing some of that a little more formally. Oh, a, a couple thoughts, but actually what I'm hearing is uh, this little road show should be at the end of the contributor summit. Like a sit down between the two groups sounds like that really needs to happen rather than, you know, maybe just a separate, a separate thing. Um, but, but yeah, Tim, something you said I think is just a theme that we've seen over and over again with this disconnect between um, 
there is business value in what somebody is doing, but they don't know how to communicate it in a way that hits home with the person who's cutting the check. And anything that we can do to help bridge that gap, I think would be fantastic. Okay. It, it's, I think the real challenge here is we're all trained to operate in this world a certain way. And the way that open source works is not that way, right? So we bring expectations that when we exchange money for goods and services, right? But when we come to this, if you to go volunteer and <coughs> serve soup to people on Thanksgiving or something like that, you have different expectations. But people are bringing the expectations that are set in life into this forum, and when they don't stand, meet those expectations, they're kind of, you know, there's a, a gap and people are unsatisfied. So understanding how to create something that operates for people that's against the grain of what society is today is really the challenge that we're up against. And I think that that is, is going to be a really tough problem to solve. Um, and it's probably going to be a mix of both, right? Centralized and decentralized <coughs> answers where we direct funding through some places and have it. I'd, it's just a really hard problem that's evident in this space, but probably there are other forums in life where we have very similar problems. If you've ever served on a PTA, Going to a PTA board meeting is exactly like going to a CNCF meeting. Yeah. Nobody's got any money, there's problems everywhere, and no, there's five people that help, and the school's got 5,000 kids. So I want to add on to what Ann was talking about, is there's a skills gap within software engineering that is not taught in universities. It's not taught when you're in the business or in a nonprofit. It's one of those things that you learn through trial and error and exposure opportunities, and it is being able to speak to others and communicate effectively. It wasn't until I joined open source that I was able to start understanding more about business needs and obligations to their shareholders, um, and that was after I left the federal government. To be able to learn those skills has been invaluable, and then trying to teach that to others, how to untie those knots to be impactful to the business and show that your contributions that are happening upstream, many links away from where the business can actually see dollars coming back in for a return on investment, that's a hard sell. And being able to talk that talk and not only do that, but reach the individuals that are in the positions of authority to allow you to have those opportunities is exceedingly difficult. And it's not something that's talked about very often, and it's something that's very difficult to get published in a way that's consistent because your business as an end user or your business as a vendor is going to have very different incentives and we need to provide guidance, education and awareness opportunities for software engineers in the ecosystem to capitalize on those resources and this institutional knowledge that many of us have amassed. And it's got to be on a case-by-case -case basis. We can generalize up to a certain degree, but ultimately, you are an engineer. You are designed in your brain to figure out how things work and to make improvements. So this is something that we all have the capacity to do. It's just a different application of that skill set. Yeah, one thing that I cannot advocate for strongly enough, and we've done very effectively where, where I am, is we have an internal workshop for communication skills for engineers. Part of it is how do I communicate technical skills? How do I write a better RFC? You know, that part's mostly written, a little bit verbal. And then part is more business value stuff. That part's more verbal, less written. Um, but it's a, a pretty intensive course that engineers have, the feedback's been phenomenal. It's something we've only been doing a couple of years and a program will definitely expand. All right, I think that pretty much brings us, us to the end of this session. I'm sure we'll be around the conference. So find us. I know if you'd want to ask a question, if you didn't feel like asking a question in public, you want to catch us in private, we're all open for discussions. But thank you very much, and thank you to all the GB members. Thank you.